Okay, hello. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to our event. My name is Sachin Thule, and I'm a faculty associate at the Wisconsin School of Business, where I teach uh, undergraduate and graduate courses in international business and marketing. And I'm also affiliated with uh, several of the centers that are sponsoring today's event. Uh, today's sponsor is the Institute for Regional and International Studies, which is a national resource center, the IRS NRC, its acronym supports international and global awareness and inspires informed thinking about the complexities of our world by providing resources and expertise to K through 12 educators and students and the community at large. I'd also like to thank uh, Wisconsin School of Business, uh, the Center for South Asia and International Studies majors as additional co-sponsors of today's event. Carmen Pitts is running tech support. Thank you, Carmen. If you have any challenges with the technology, uh, please use the chat function to reach out to her. Uh, we are recording today's event and we'll share uh, through a post link email uh, information, uh, more information about this talk and a recording. Uh, you will be showing up uh, on the recording if your microphone is, is turned on. Uh, so keep that in mind during the Q&A session. Uh, before we begin, I just thought I'd frame a little bit of, of today's agenda. And of course, the field of international business and the idea of international careers is very diverse. Uh, our two speakers today, our two panelists will be able to give you a sense of some of that diversity uh, because there's international business careers in business, but in my view, there's international, everything in a sense is a business and runs somewhat like a business. So, you know, government is organized around having functions that are very much business-like. So there's government careers, international business, NGOs, nonprofits, and, and business as well. So uh, the, the, the agenda for today is that I'll ask both of our speakers to spend 15, 20 minutes providing some context on that diversity of what the business world looks like in the international context by sharing their own path in their careers. And I think you'll find there's uh, always serendipity, it seems, and always some level of circuitous, circuitousness in, uh, in these journeys that, that people have. Uh, and also, you know, let me just preface uh, these remarks by, you know, thinking about what the business world will look like post COVID. I think uh, we, we will probably see a, law, a, a strong resurgence in interest in, in trade and re-engagements with other countries. I think one clear lesson from the crisis has been how much uh, we are dependent on other nations and how much uh, they are dependent on us and also how fragile uh, things actually are. And so uh, uh, PwC, PricewaterhouseCoopers, uh, published a talent mobility report, Talent 2020. And in that report, which involved serving 900 companies, they showed uh, increasing mobility, and in, meaning uh, the deployment of, of mobile workforce, uh, averaging between 25 to 50% in the last decade. Of course, I think the nature of, of global mobility is, is gonna change, especially after this crisis, how, how, how familiar we all have become with the technologies we're using today. I think there's gonna be less the idea of expatriate assignments that are full-time, multi-year, and more the idea of, of using and, and deploying people in global teams, uh, multinational teams with infrequent and regular uh, travel. Uh, so the other factors that are kind of pushing forward uh, the demands of, 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 of global uh, re human resources and global mobility will be that firms are expanding to new markets, uh, that's where the growth is gonna be. They're uh, acquiring foreign companies. And so they'll need to uh, extend their knowledge and culture to these acquisitions, but also learn and bring back subsidiary knowledge from these overseas um, offices. And, but I think the other big piece to keep in mind uh, for those of you in the audience today is the changing nature of kind of the business deal with workers. And surprisingly or unsurprisingly, most college graduates around the world, this is not just the US perspective, but most college graduates around the world are, are stating that they wanna have an international experience as part of their career. So maybe this is something that was kind of niche in the past, but it's become kind of mainstream now. And uh, so part of attracting talent for global organizations going forward is going to be offer them some aspect of, of global mobility, global and uh, international work in their careers if, if they want to be competitive with the, the companies they have to compete uh, for talent for. Uh, so an example, just uh, I was reading the other day in Bloomberg, uh, there's a FinTech, which means finance and technology. 
a firm called Revolut in, in the UK. And they announced that they've done the, the background research on, and Tanya's nodding her head, uh, they've done some background work on the tax, the visa, the other implications, but they're gonna promise uh, their workers uh, the ability to work two months uh, a year abroad, right? So I think that's part of the changing nature of this global mobility piece. So uh, before I introduce uh, our speakers, uh, and we'll go, uh, J JP Nash is here and Tanya Nitschke is here. I uh, just wanna thank them in advance for uh, the time that they invested with us. And I'm sure this will be a very enriching and interactive uh, session. Uh, the format we've uh, had today is that uh, each speaker will be given 15 to 20 minutes to, to share their story a bit and, and, and have some advice for you. And then we'll save questions uh, for the end. And then we'll do kind of a, a panel. So if you could jot down your questions, uh, you can send them through in the chat, but just in order to maybe get a sense for where the room is at, uh, we'll address those questions towards the end uh, with all, all three of us uh, there. So uh, let me introduce our first speaker. Jay P. Nash is the founder and principal of Nash Global Trade Services. Through NGTS, Jay helps businesses in a variety of industries, including aviation, electronics, telecommunications, defense, automotive, IT, chemical. Seems like he touches pretty much uh, all the, all the a, a, broad, a wide variety of, of businesses and industries. And uh, he works with them on uh, navigating the complex uh, US foreign export controls. And he's been doing this since, uh, since 2017. Uh, prior to this, uh, he was a managing director with the firm Securus Trade, Strategic Trade Solutions. And from 2005 to 2010, Jay was a senior associate with the Center for International Trade and Security at the University of Georgia. Jay currently serves as the president of the Madison International Trade Association and on the editorial board of the World Export Control Review. He speaks and writes frequently on global trade controls and compliance and is a guest instructor at the Export Compliance Training Institute. He has associate uh, member status with the Commonwealth of Virginia Bar Association. He holds a JD from the University of Iowa College of Law uh, and an MA from Georgetown University School of Foreign Service Security Studies program. Uh, Jay also holds a BA in political science from the University of Michigan. He has traveled to and worked in over 40 countries and has lived and worked uh, in Beijing, China. He's proficient in spoken Mandarin. Jay, over to you. Thank you, Sachin. Um, and I want to thank uh, you, Carmen and Iris, and all of those here today for having me to be part of this uh, discussion. Uh, it's a great privilege. Um, as you just heard, I'm kind of in a unique position. I'm a, a Wolverine Hawkeye here in Badger country, but, uh, you know, Big Ten all the way. I'm, I've always enjoyed the Big Ten uh, environment. Um, and uh, as, as Sachin mentioned, um, I'll talk, take you through a little bit about how I ended up where I am in, in some of the roles that Sachin mentioned. Um, I'll also, of course, try and share with you some of the lessons and takeaways I have from that experience, and I'll uh, look forward to answering any questions uh, that you all have. Um, to kind of get started, I think I should maybe explain a little bit more about what exactly it is that I do. Uh, you, I think Sachin and, and in my bio, there's a lot of terms and things in there that, that some may be familiar with, but others may be a little bit newer. Um, so I work in a very special area of, of, I would say, international trade and in a way, international security. Um, so the work, the consulting work that I do, uh, yes, it's for the you know, corporate business community in terms of how they trade in certain products and technologies. But what I'm largely helping them do is try and understand and get the necessary government authorizations and permissions to trade in their goods uh, because sometimes the, the goods that they trade in in all those different industry sectors that Sachin mentioned, there's some people out there that want to use them to do not good things, to put it kind of simply. Um, so in most cases, because they have some type of weapon or terrorism or something related application. So that's sort of the genesis behind what, um, you know, why these regulations, why this area exists, um, but it's also, I think, you know, what has created an opportunity 
and and my international background, my government background is what put me in a position to then understand the government side of it, the regulatory side of it, but then to work with companies to help them, as you heard Sachin say, navigate that, to, to comply with the rules, to be able to trade and sell their products in all the different international markets they want to in as seamless and an uninhibited way as possible. So that's just kind of give you a little bit of context and, and hopefully that'll, you know, kind of as I go through my career path, you'll understand how, you know, like many of you, I took a, a background and an interest in international affairs and did do some work more, as Sachin mentioned and emphasized in the more government kind of policy realm, but over time have turned that into more of a quote business field uh, in doing international trade consulting. And the other thing I wanna say about kind of the work that I do now is, and this is very much the Sachin's opening point, is that I would say actually 50% of the work that I do is actually for the US government. Um, so I, it's not as pretty clear in, in my bio and what, what was introduced earlier, but one of my probably biggest single client is the US government. I, again, 50% of my annual revenue uh, and my consulting and other work comes from, from the US government through government contracts and grants and other opportunities. And I'll talk more about that and why I think that's a really important area uh, for something you all to consider uh, in just a little bit. Um, I think I, we talked about some of the international background I have and, and we'll get into more of that. Just one thing I, I wanna kinda actually point out that I don't have and, and you may have already picked up on some of the perspectives I, I can't necessarily bring to you, but thankfully we have Tanya here who I think will be able to, um, is I don't have in-house corporate experience. So my international business career has always been quotes on the outside. I've never actually worked in the federal government and I've never actually worked in-house in a corporation. So it's always been more of a support advisory external capacity, just something to keep, keep in mind. And I have, you know, as, as you probably heard, my background certainly is business related and, and has a business nexus, but it's not a quote traditional business background. I didn't, I took some business courses when I was in undergrad. Um, I didn't go to business school, I went to law school. So again, I think maybe others can, can share their experience from that. And then the last thing I, I think that I'm, I'm sure, you know, Tanya probably could, could fill in and where, where my, area, my background is a little bit, uh, has a little bit of a gap, is having a deep, deep, deep tech experience. Um, you know, like, I, you know, we're, I'm in a funny position, you know, I don't, I don't know, even know what they technically call my generation, Generation X or Z, I, I can't even recall which one it is, but I, we kind of fall right in the middle. You know, yeah, like my parents and such, you know, obviously it's totally new to them. To me, you know, when we were just start, when, when I was in your, when I was your age in, in undergrad, um, like we were just starting to use email uh, as a re in a regular way. So, uh, but it was enough to be able to catch on with some of the tech developments, but in, in terms of turning them into marketable, um, career advancing uh, use of technology, that was something that my, you know, I and my generation kind of missed just by a little bit, you know, and we're playing catch up. So the reason why I'm saying that is, what you're gonna hear me talk about that took me probably 25 years to do with some of the technologies that they have specifically in my field, uh, in, in particular, like data analytics, um, AI, all, machine learning, all these kinds of things, emerging technologies that you see now, someone starting in your position probably could get close to the type of work that I do and the service that I provide to my clients, I would say probably within five years. Uh, and I'm not, not selling myself short there. Um, now, the trick is to understand where those clients are and how to apply all those technologies and, and they can't do everything for you. But just to kind of give a, a perspective that I, and, and a, you know, I think you're all in a very, very good position that you have these incredible information management, data analytic technologies that can help you do your work. Um, and so that's something you really, even if you're not a super technologist and the world's number one 
you know, you don't have 8 million followers on TikTok, you know, just having, being in that position, I think puts you at a, a in some ways at a nice, nice position. So that's, uh, we'll come back to some of that. Um, you know, in terms of how I got to, to where I was, I, I was kind of thinking about it and there's a lot of different areas I can come at, ways I can come at it, but I was thinking about it in three kind of takeaways, three lessons or considerations for you. Uh, one, and it sounds a little trite, but is having that, an interest or a passion. The work that I do now that involves, um, it involves international trade, involves inter consulting, international security, international affairs, I could in some ways trace to a course I took in undergrad as a sophomore called uh, Problems in World Politics, US-China Relations. That, and, and if you think back to that point, uh, you know, that was already a little bit late in the game, I could say, where people were realizing, okay, the US-China relationship is going to be a huge, huge, huge impact for the foreseeable future. And, you know, fast forward, here we are 25 years. So I think we're, that's, that's certainly come to fruition. But I was really intrigued. I was interested in that class. And it really started off um, an interest that I had in international affairs in some of the issues, the trade, the business, and the security and international relations aspects surrounding all of that. And that's something that I held on to, I kind of anchored to, and was always connected to throughout, no matter what I did in some way, shape, or form throughout the arc and, and trajectory of my career. And, and I think that's sort of, so lesson takeaway one is, you know, having a, a, that kind of interest, even if you, as you heard Sachin say, your career arc starts to take you away from it for whatever reason, I, I think having some connection back to it, to what that interest is, will always, I think, something that can serve you well. So um, whatever it is, you know, certainly a lot of you are in international affairs already, or, and, and you're looking for ways to apply your business. Really, I, I would encourage you if, you, if there's a particular aspect of your international affairs area, whether it's more in the development sphere, if it's in the international trade sphere, security, international relations, whatever it is, you know, I would really encourage you to hold on to that, have a kind of a tie rope to that. You don't have to be anchored on it, but just have a tie rope to it that, that you keep um, and it, you can always pull you back to that kind of line through your career. Um, so, and, and with that, uh, one thing I, I want to say is you, with that, if you do it, approach it that way, as, as Sachin was alluding to, you don't have to have a linear, linear trajectory to your career where you go from point A to point you know, B and then to point D and then C and then you get to Z eventually. There's not, certainly nothing to be wrong with doing it that way. Um, and that can be, save you a lot of time and certainly is uh, very efficient. And you know, I'm not, I would probably recommend that you at least look at, start looking at it that way. But I just, I wanna come from the camp of saying you don't have to approach it quite that way. So uh, one of the themes I wanna say is if you're not an archer, then take up golf, okay? So if you're not gonna be able, if you're not the type and, and you're not situated where you can look at a target and you're gonna fire and you're gonna hit that target and then look at your next target and hit it, take, it, take up golf. You wanna put yourself in the position near the green or on the green, close to where you wanna get to in the vicinity, in the arena of where you wanna to get to. And that's something that I did throughout all of my career in, in international business. So for example, um, in each place I was in my career, even when I was doing something that had nothing to do with international affairs, I was working in San Francisco as a litigation consultant for two years in between undergrad and when I went to law school. But there I was studying, I studied Chinese through a night program at UC Berkeley just to keep up um, you know, some connection to that interest that I had. I always wanted to hold on to that. And I always, when I was looking at and applying to law school, I specifically was looking at schools that had strong international law or international programs. And Iowa at the time was one of the top 10. So that's kind of why I decided to then look at Iowa. So even though, you know, there's all these great schools in DC or New York, or, I mean, there's a million places you can go to law school that in some ways could better position you for an international business career, you know, Iowa really could hold its own on the international law. And that's kind of what, what my, remember, my hook was. So that's why I kind of en ended up going to Iowa 
And there's another reason why I did that that I'll come back to in just um, in just a few minutes. But then, so I, you know, again, building the academic background, but tailoring it to what that interest is that you want to do, that I think is a good way to position yourself for that international business career. So even when I was at law school, uh, I created, I always looked for whatever international law courses, international business courses they had, they didn't maybe have as many as uh, Columbia or other program, or maybe not even, not even, not even as many as Wisconsin, but whatever there was there, I, I, I focused on that. Um, I kind of was, a, I, I was comfortable doing things a little differently in that, you know, the traditional arc again, probably is to go to grad school, get a master's and then go to law school. I did the opposite. Uh, I kind of knew pretty early on that the traditional legal practice going to a, you know, let's say a big firm and then going, you know, progressing that way. I, I had a pretty good sense that that's not where the, 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 the green that I was shooting for. Um, I, I would kind of wanted to be more in a more of a government oriented type work. And so I went to business uh, to graduate school after to actually increase my international affairs, and international security credos more than I did go to, you know, a, a law firm to get that traditional law experience, because I knew chances are, especially back then, I wasn't going to be practicing in international law, I would be doing litigation and tort reform or something like that. So, um, so that's something else I would, I would certainly recommend. And then going along with that, you know, was getting experience really any way I could in the field. So in some of those in-between times or to supplement the education, as you heard Sachin mention the big, the, the relevance of nonprofits, NGOs, I took internships with them that were in international affairs, international security or trade related fields like the American Enterprise Institute, um, I, uh, the Woodrow Wilson Center in Washington, D.C., things like that, that could also, A, get me some, uh, quotes, real world experience, B, was tied, again, to that passion or interest that I had, and, and C, you know, I thought could give me a nice springboard to the next position. And the result of that is, and this goes to the serendipity part of what Sachin was talking about, um, you know, I was actually at my internship at AEI, I was doing research on this topic for, for my class at Georgetown on this thing called export controls. And I had saw that there, I had seen that there was a center, this university based center that really specialized. It was very unique. So I'm at lunch at the, um, at, at AEI, they, they would have uh, daily lunches for all the interns and they encourage you to come and be enlightened by all their experts. You know, the intern, you come and you talk and you can sit at the table with all their experts. And I'll be honest, I never went to those lunches. I kind of ate by myself, which is not a, uh, a good recommendation for network building, which is one of my key points. But I figured one day I'm gonna, okay, I'm gonna go and I'm gonna sit at one of the tables. I'm chatting with somebody. He says, I'm from Georgia. I say, oh, I was on this site of the Center for International Trade and Security. Uh, they have this, they do this really neat thing called export controls. He's like, oh yes, that's my, my father uh, is the head of that center. They're actually looking for a position here in Washington, D.C. Are you interested? Boom. There's my first job. And so that's the serendipity part, you know, I, that and, and that kind of goes along with the theme of the kind of the golf theme a little bit. It's it's putting yourself in the right position to when that opportunity comes along, then you can jump on it. So so again, I would say shoot the arrow, aim for it from the beginning. But even if you don't, it's about putting yourself in position. And that's really what serendipity is. Serendipity is not luck, which a lot of people you know, confuse it with. Serendipity is putting yourself in a lucky position to take advantage of something uh, when that opportunity comes along. So just kind of a, a little bit of a, a story there. Um, and, and some of the things that I did to, to get to position where I am. Um, a couple of the other things, you know, that, that I would also uh, advocate and that Sachin mentioned is the business of government. Uh, just to add a few points to what Sachin mentioned, uh, some statistics. 40% of U.S. government discretionary funding goes to government contractors and, and is the government as a client, you know, purchasing goods and services, okay? That amounts to about more, uh, comes out to a little bit more than half a trillion dollars, um, which is about equal to the revenue of the commercial banking industry on an annual, in 2019 at least. So moral of the story is the government is a huge client um, and there are tremendous opportunities. So you can approach government as Sachin was talking about 
from a business angle to work in government, but I would really encourage you to think about working for government, you know, in a whole host of other related fields that are supported by government contracting. There's a reason why Washington DC is the fifth most expensive market to live in after New York, San Francisco, Boston, and I forget what the other one is, but um, you know, and, and I remember living there in, in, 2000, in the 2003 and you know, it was, it, and I had lived in San Francisco two years before that. Um, and the housing prices I thought were worth a little shack in no offense to the those who owned them, but literally a little shack in Washington D.C. would cost seven hundred, eight hundred thousand dollars, easy, um, in 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 the suburbs. So, and I always wondered where is all where is all this money coming from? I mean, I always hear government servants they don't make so much. Well, it's it's not only the government service, but it is all of that government contracting and the government spending. Um, you know, regardless of what your views are about government you know, as a, as a spending a lot of money on contractors, it's just, that's just the reality of, of how our government operates. It's an incredible amount is done through government contracting and there are tremendous business opportunities in uh, a wide variety in any international related field for those um, who are interested. Um, let's see, ah, one example of that, uh, just from my own business is, you know, in my consulting world in trade compliance, I'm sometimes competing with the big consulting firms like a Deloitte or a PwC, you know, to, to provide trade compliance services. What I found though is more recently that PwCs, Deloitte's and others are competing with me in the government contracting work that I do, which they were not, at least in my area, which is again, international trade and security. You know, I think they probably advise the government in more financial accounting areas, but now I see them coming into more of the international space and competing with me and my organization for government contracts. Uh, so that just kind of shows you that if, if those organizations are heading in that direction, I think there's a reason. It's because there's tremendous opportunity there. Um, the last thing I kind of want to say, and then I think I should, I should turn it over uh, to Tanya. Something else that, that kind of worked for me was not being a, 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 a big fish in a small pond kind of idea, but being, a, a, I'd say, a unique fish in a small to medium-sized pond. Um, you know, as, as you probably may have heard, Julius Caesar, the famous line was, he said, I'd rather be first in a village than second in Rome. And, and there's something to that. And it's not just be about being, you know, the, the leader of the big fish. Um, it's, it's about, I think, having... Uh, an opportunity and access to opportunities that um, you may not come uh, as easily in all of those kind of other more, more bigger kind of challenging, exciting environments. Now I did go and work in those. I did work in New York. I did work in San Francisco. I did Washington. And I would encourage you to, to spend some time working in those markets and probably more cutting your teeth in those markets and getting the experience. But when you, when, when you've done that, then you're more, you become instantly more attractive to a uh, University of Iowa School of Law. You know, I probably, I, I'll, I'll be honest, I don't know how my numbers fit. And I don't know if I would get into, into and UW today, especially with purely my numbers. But with my experience um, working in international affairs and, and having that language ability in Chinese, which I, of course, highly recommend, I think that made me a little bit more unique, a little bit more interesting. And then when I was in Iowa, when there were opportunities for fellowships, foreign language acquisition fellowships that I took, uh, Stanley scholarships to go and study abroad, which you've heard is, is very important. I was sometimes out of one or two people applying and probably one of the, you know, just starting out the best position for, whereas if I tried to do that working, if I was in Georgetown at that point in my career or in uh, another school, it would be me and 50 other people or hundred other people applying. Now I'm not saying shy away from a challenge and don't shoot for the top, but I just want to offer that to you that there's tremendous opportunity in some of those smaller to medium markets uh, especially after you've gathered some of those ex that experience, that unique experience in some of the bigger markets. And another example of that is me being here in Wisconsin uh, and Madison. I don't know that I would be the president of the Council on Foreign Relations or the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, but I can be the president of the Madison International Trade Association uh, coming here with my background a little bit 
unique, a little bit different. Um, and that made me, I think, a, a good fit and, a, and, a, and attractive to my colleagues here in Madison to serve in that capacity. Um, I think those are just some of, the, some of the points I wanted to make. So again, to kind of summarize, having that passion, that interest, you know, especially if it's international and, and, tra and keeping some tie to that, thinking about government as, uh, as, a, as a potential business op in the business of government, if you will, especially coming from an international background, thinking about where you are. And, and it's not so much, I think about, you know, I, I realized for myself, it became more about what I wanted to be, like what exact position or what exact career, but more in what arena did I wanna be in? And if you take that mindset, I think that opens up a whole lot of other opportunities and actually may be a way that you can get to your the destination. Again, it may not be an arrow shot, but it may be a, a, a golf game, a, a golf hole, where you can kind of play your way to that point where eventually you'll get it in the hole. Um, last thing I wanna say, um, I think, you know, again, the other, the other points is, you know, you're going to obviously need to make some times and investments. The biggest one for, for this type of career, I would definitely say the language, and definitely the travel piece. Um, I spent a lot of time on the road and I did spend a lot of time building my network. I know that's something that, that's very important. And I, I'll probably let Tanya talk to, to about that a little bit more. But, um, you know, going to conferences, going to events, um, using LinkedIn, getting your name out, connecting with people who are in the area of your interests, um, and then creating your own speaking and writing opportunities. I would say eventually, instead of being a consumer and attender of conferences and, and, and platforms, be a contributor. Um, and that's really where I think, you know, the network starts to grow and the opportunities grow with it. So uh, with that, I think I probably went a little too long, but I'll turn it back to you, Sachin. Thank you. Thanks. And I'll take questions later. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Jay. That was great. And I think we've got some definite pieces we can circle back to in the, in the Q&A session. Uh, so let me introduce our next speaker. Uh, Tanya Nitschke is currently Vice President of Global HR, Talent Management and Total Rewards at Eventbrite, the leading global platform, platform for live events. Uh, prior to Eventbrite, Tanya has over 10 years of strategic HR and HR leadership uh, with high tech and fast growing financial services companies including Funding Circle, Twitter, Groupon, and CUNY Mutual Group. Uh, she's seen firsthand what it takes to scale successful people organizations globally uh, in these high-tech, high, -tech, high uh, fast paced growth environments. Her experience includes three IPOs, M&A activity, executive coaching, and extended assignments in Europe. Uh, Tanya holds a BBA uh, in international business and uh, management and human resources from the Wisconsin School of Business at UW-Madison. Uh, she resides in one of these high cost places in San Francisco uh, with uh, her husband and her uh, Bernie doodle, Marty. Uh, so Tanya, I'll let you take it over. Thank you. All right, great. Well, thanks so much. Um, I, I am excited to be here and connect with everybody. Thank you for the opportunity. Kind of felt like I just wanted to continue to listen to Jay, but um, I, I'll also chime in here too. So uh, today, I, I thought I'd share three stories with all of you to give you an insight into my career and call attention to um, a couple tangible things that you can think about as you explore your career opportunities in international business. And so the first one will be the real story behind that bio Sachin just gave. The second story will be what I consider the top global business skill that you can actually start working on now. And the third one is the question that led to a lot more questions. I was getting kind of creative with that last one. So I'll, I'll go through um, a couple stories for you. So the first one, the real story behind the bio. Now you hear these bios and even when I write these, I'm like, oh man, <sighs> like it's just kind of the polished version, right? And it, there, there's a lot behind the scenes. I wanna give you a little bit more uh, behind the scenes. What's, what's the real story? So went to UW. Before that, you know, I grew up on a family business. I was interested in studying business. I loved learning about languages and cultures. My dad's side of the family is from Serbia. My mom's side is German. I, I started learning both um, at an earlier age. And I just loved all of these different topics. 
went to UW, got involved in international business, management and human resources, studied Serbian and German, which is amazing to have that ability um, at a university. Um, and I studied abroad in uh, Freiburg, Germany as well and continued to travel. I stumbled upon ISIC. It's an international student organization um, at UW-Madison and many other universities around the world that facilitates an international exchange program. Uh, I originally got involved with it because I loved meeting people from all over the world and given all, the, all, all of these um, you know, interests I just explained. Um, what I learned was that there were a lot of students leaving UW to go abroad and have these great experiences, but not a lot of students from other, other places coming to UW-Madison. I said, well, got to up this exchange, right? So I started working with area companies to say, hey, you want an intern? And I got, my pitch got better after that. Um, and I started learning about all of these businesses that really had a need for someone from another country with another language skill, another cultural um, identity to come to the States for two to 18 months J-1 visa program. And what I realized is that I was in these rooms with a, typically a business leader and then sometimes someone in HR. Now, sometimes that HR person was there for kind of compliance payroll admin purposes and was, was kind of um, uh, not really thought of as a, as a partner with the business leader. And sometimes that person was asking really great questions and connecting with that business leader as a partner to figure out how to solve a problem. They had something they needed to do with their business. They had something they had to figure out with getting the right people at the right time in the right place all over the world. And I was like, man, that's hard. That's really, how do you, how do you figure that out? Right? Because businesses are constantly changing. People are constantly changing. They're constantly getting different skills, different needs out there. And I just fell in love with this intersection of people in business on a global scale. And so I, I didn't really know what that meant though, right? And so I had, I was like, no, you know, I'm, I'm in the business school. I'm gonna get it, uh, I'm gonna go to consulting and I'm gonna get my MBA and that's the thing I'm gonna do. And I'm like, oh, I'm gonna work. I, I like, you know, international. Yep, I'm gonna, I'm doing German. I'm gonna move to Frankfurt. I'm gonna work at Deutsche Bank. I'm gonna get involved in, in, you know, international exchange rates or some kind of crazy thing I was thinking. But that was in my head and that was the should, right? And that, that was like, that's my path. That's what I'm gonna do. And, but I kept right, like learning about like business and people and leadership and, and what was going on there. But I, and I said, yeah, that'll be relevant with this path that I have. So I, I got an internship at CUNA Mutual Group just down the road in Mineral Point had the lovely you know, summer in Madison. And I uh, joined their HR team um, as an intern. And I thought, still, I'm gonna just do this for a summer. I'm gonna graduate, gonna go do that path. I fell in love with building something um, and learning about HR, learning from other people in the, in the environment um, that I was in. And it turned into a full-time job. And then it, it, I like, I, I continued to stay open to that and understand what that was. And then I moved to Chicago. At that point, I was still thinking, you know, but I'm gonna get back on my path, right? Like I, I gotta, you know, I grow up here. I gotta get back on this path. And I thought, uh, moved to Chicago. I had a job opportunity at a financial services firm, pretty similar to CUNA Mutual. And um, I was studying for my GMAT. I actually took the GMAT. And I met someone, um, the chief people officer at Groupon, given a, a, a former colleague knew um, him, met him. This was Groupon, this was pre-IPO. Um, we were taking teams from to 50 to 300 in six months, acquiring companies globally, um, average age 22. It was just kind of crazy, right? And so um, I had an opportunity to go and build. It was really ambiguous. It was like, hey, you've got all of this great um, knowledge about how to build an HR, how, how does HR team look in an established company? CUNA Mutual, I mean, it's credit insurance for credit unions starting in the 1800s, average age 45, really, really different GE backing, Lean Six Sigma, we all went through, very, very different. And they said, you know, you've got this great background, why don't you apply it to a whole different thing? And you know what, I'll teach you, I'll guide you, I'll help you. This was the chief people officer there. And this guy had an amazing pedigree. And I was like, wait, this guy wants to take a risk on me. He's at, like having, asking me to build something. This sounds good. Like this sounds like once in a lifetime opportunity, but it's a huge risk. What is Groupon? Coupons? Like, what is this? Right. And so I, I kept thinking about that should, like I should stay on my path. 
And as you can tell, I took the risk, I did it. And it completely changed um, my career. And I got rid of that should, I got rid of that path. I continued to stay open. I continued to anchor, um, as Jay was saying, on what did I really love, right? I loved people and business and I loved international um, and actually wasn't getting too much of the international at Groupon, um, but with Groupon, I got to learn tech. They moved me out to the Bay Area. Um, here, then I went to Twitter. Twitter was also, this is early days Twitter, um, pre-IPO uh, US team. Then I worked with their team to open up in 20 countries around the world. And I actually got to do a stint in Ireland, all because I continued to express my interest and desire and ability to learn. And so as soon as something uh, opened up in Dublin, our uh, Twitter's European headquarters, they said, oh yeah, didn't Tanya want to do something like this? Hey, do you want to go to Ireland for three months? I'm like, yes. And that turned into a year and a half later, you know, and I continued to, to just say yes to things and continue to explore. And there were so many times that I said yes, and then I think later that evening, like, am I crazy? Like, that's kind of risky. I don't know what I'm getting myself into. Um, but continue to stay open to it, continue to be pretty vulnerable about it too, and learn along the way. Um, you know, from there, um, I went to Funding Circle. Um, I traveled a ton in Europe, and now I'm at Eventbrite. I mean, I started a year ago uh, at the at a live events experience company at the start of COVID. And so these are all just like kind of... Um, really uh, big moves, but they all are anchored around what I care about. I care about people in business. I care about it at an international scale. All of this also has a thread of, um, the, you know, I, I grew up on that small business. There are all of these things that are connected there that I continue to be really interested in. And so I just thought that like, you know, doing international banking in Frankfurt, hey, that could have been cool too, right? There are a lot of different things that could come but my, my thing, my point here is that take a risk, be open, explore, don't put too much pressure on yourself to define that perfect path. There is no such thing. There are jobs that I am aware of now actually creating at our own company that never existed before, right? And so um, you could almost limit yourself too much to have that defined path. Um, and, you know, look at different industries, different roles. I know I speak with tech, but there's, you know, even in tech, there's localization, there's social impact, there's communications. There's so many different organizations that have a global footprint that could get you that exposure. You could also think of companies that are global that can train you in a lot of different business skills, consulting, technology, healthcare, and then you build a network. And that is huge. All of the different roles. When I went to CUNA Mutual, someone passed my resume to the chief people officer at Groupon, right? I knew people then at um, Groupon that gave me recommendations for Twitter. The people at Twitter, they hired me at Funding Circle. Then the, they, the former COO at Twitter knows my CEO at Eventbrite. Like everyone knows everybody somehow, right? And so it's always, you know, staying open, taking those risks and connecting with people and just like leaning in and learning more. So that is the real story. Um, behind my bio and one that's all about taking risks and, and staying open. The second one is the top skill to focus on. And I thought it was great that Sachin mentioned um, acquisitions. So uh, when I joined Funding Circle, um, they grew mainly through acquisition. UK based company bought a company in continental Europe, another one in the US. When I came in, the top thing I heard was, yeah, well, you know, in the US, they do it that way. Well, in Germany, I don't know, they're crazy. They do it this way and all of these different things, right? And it was, and the, the power of that company was dependent on those company, the individual companies coming together. Same with Eventbrite. We acquired so many different companies. If they don't come together, you don't get the power of that acquisition. And so, what we needed to do was really unlock this ability to understand and share what's going on with other people, right? And that's empathy. <laughs> that is truly empathy. And you need to have it in today's world, especially top skill for global business success. You start with empathy to build trust, the foundation of a strong relationship, you, that awareness, um, of just being aware, just understanding things are different. People have different experiences, different languages, different cultures that that builds to appreciation 
And that builds to truly valuing diverse experiences and perspectives. And so think of the, the different group work that you have today um, at school, the con the, the, the um, all of the work that you're doing to think about how do you communicate with people verbally, non-verbally, all of these different things, you're building these skills and they can be all translatable in any setting, especially um, international business. And so, you know, think about your last group project. Like, how did you show up in that? Think about the, your last interaction with somebody from another culture. Like what, you know, what was going on in your head? What, who knows what was going on in their, their head, right? And so I think of uh, language skills being super, super important in that because learning a language is really difficult and you get to see how hard it is to communicate a concept or an idea when it, it isn't your native language. And you can better appreciate someone else who is on a Zoom in another country, eight hours away, that is trying to communicate a difficult topic to you, that then you understand that a lot better. You also understand that uh, exact translations are really difficult. There are some phrases that I think of sometimes in Serbian that I'm like, I just don't know the right words to put that into English. Sometimes German, but not quite. And so you, 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 because you know that, you can better empathize um, with other people and understand that you can, um, there, there's a different level of connection there. So all of these things, I think, start with empathy. And that's why I think it's the top thing to, to start there, build that empathy, and then continue to build those relationships and communications, things you can start doing now and paying attention to as you grow your career. The last one, last story is about um, the question that led to a lot more questions. So uh, at Twitter, um, I did a number of different roles there. Um, I, you know, grew, helped grow the, the sales team. Um, then I went to Dublin, Ireland. Then I came back to headquarters in SF and I was working on sales comp. Um, so how do you um, compensate salespeople all over the world? And um, I was on the, the compensation and benefits team. And uh, earlier in the year, the team announced that we were going to uh, create a global parenting program at Twitter, where we were going to give up to 20 weeks fully paid off for anyone welcoming a family into their, or a child into their life, whether that's through surrogacy or pregnancy or adoption or anything. Um, and whoever you are, you're a parent. And so this was different than, you know, a disability leave when you're, you're uh, in, in the US, um, if you're giving birth. Um, this was different for many other countries on the paternal side of things, um, if you're a non-birth parent, I should say. And so we announced that we were gonna do this. Um, that was something we we're gonna do. And we put it in place in the US and the announcement said, later on this year, we'll roll it out to the rest of the other countries. And it we kept saying that like every month. And so I, I said to, uh, our um, uh, head of total rewards, head of compensation benefits, total rewards. Um, I said, why do we keep doing that? Like, when are we gonna get to this? We keep saying, yeah, non-US, you know, and it's never on a roadmap, it's never a priority. Like it's always this non-US thing. And uh, as you can tell, I hate when people say it's, non it's a non-US and then it's kind of lingering. And, and I said, why? And she goes, yeah, what do, what do you think? I'm like, well, why, why are we doing that? She said, well, go do it then. I'm like, oh, uh, okay, like I'll go do it. Cause I really felt we needed to do it. I had no idea what I was doing. And so I needed to ask a lot more questions. I needed to understand, well, what do leave benefits look like in 20 countries around the world? We were at 24 at the time. What do leave benefits look like? What do they look like for birth parents, non-birth parents, adoption, government, healthcare is very different in all of these different countries, um, how it's paid, how it's taxed, sales, you know, if you own commission, are you gonna get that or not? Every country was different. And understanding and, and, and all of those complexities. So you think like, yeah, we're just gonna give 20 weeks fully paid, simple. It is not, nothing is simple when you add it on another country and you start to understand and unlock all of these things around employment law and all of these regulations. And so I learned so much, gained so much exposure, um, asked, I had to ask a ton of questions of all of these different experts around the world about it. And so 
I think there, you know, that was something that again, I kind of dove into, I thought, Hey, this is, this isn't right. We need to fix this and we need to figure it out and stay open because the only way that we were going to make that successful in all of these different countries is to get down to the, all of those details and really figure out how it's going to work in all of those different countries. And you can't do that unless you're really open and you talk to people and even um, you can share a policy, but you want to make sure that that is actually going, that people um, feel like they can actually take advantage of it, right? And so how do you understand the kind of cultural fabric in each of the countries to understand if people are going to support someone actually taking that time, right? And so you really need to understand all the different um, mechanics there. And so I, I um, really think about this as like, asking questions and um, you know staying curious and so that can apply to some interviews that are you're, you're preparing for you know think about really good questions show you've done your research and you want to go a layer deeper um, it includes asking for feedback how could you do x better next time not just from your manager but everyone you work with and everyone you come in contact with continuing to gather that information because it's just good info it's good to, to get into those details and learn a little bit more. Um, I recently saw a quote from Adam Grant, um, if you don't know who he is, organizational psychologist and Wharton professor, um, where he was talking about how higher education exists to stoke curiosity, fuel discovery, foster debate, encourage critical thinking, and develop the next generation into more sophisticated learners. And I was like, yes, that's what it is. And so you have that right now. You do that all the time. You're programmed to do it in, in school. And so keep doing that. You know, keep, you know, stay curious, ask those powerful questions, dig into it, learn about it, because that's where you can really have a big impact um, and continue to go from there. So in closing, really, you know, take risks and explore, start with empathy and build those transferable skills. And then last but not least, stay curious and ask those really powerful questions. Great. Wonderful. Thank you, Tanya. And thank you, Jay. And, you know, to summarize, I think we saw the common thread of the common thread, right? Holding on to some piece, uh, but understanding that you know, part of people's career paths are developing uh, credibility, developing, you know, some, some knowledge that can extend to other markets or an ability to understand an industry or field to bring that knowledge uh, and expertise back home. And also this idea of being somewhat patient though, right? And, 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 uh, and, and networking uh, and being patient and keeping their options open. Um, Jay talked about being in the right place to, to let luck happen, that, that way of serendipity. And for, for Tanya, it was really effective at networking and, and staying open and saying yes to things, even they, you know, they were challenging. I think from the US perspective, I think, uh, you know, we have to understand that the, the one thing the U.S. does well, and I think our higher education system does well, is we build uh, people's comfort with ambiguity. We, we, we're in the classroom giving people challenges and asking you to solve questions and not just memorize things. So I think on one hand, it, it's a good platform, uh, our education uh, system, for you to be a generalist that can learn new things as you go along. My advice uh, would, would also be to the participants is to don't obsess, this, you know, people are oftentimes very much obsessed about the label of their major as, as necessarily being something that defines them. But I think even, I, I have so many business majors that I interact with, they don't really think about industries. Uh, they don't think about, you know, and they don't read enough uh, to understand what's happening within different industries and where, uh, even different companies, right? And so the other common thing here between Jay and Tanya was about passion. And so, uh, you know, you can have a regional passion or you can have a passion about an industry uh, to, to develop that uh, as well. So um, we're opening now uh, for you all to be able to unmute yourself if you have a question. There were a couple of uh, questions that came in uh, in writing before uh, this, today's event. So I guess we'll start there uh, until someone else has something else to ask uh, the, the speakers. So Tanya, you mentioned that one critical skill uh, was the idea of empathy and developing em empathy. Uh, someone else has asked, what are other key skills that do you think that international, that are important in international business or that companies would look for? Yeah, um, great question. I think communication, I know it's broad, 
but it's something that getting good at all levels, one-on-one -on -one, to a small group, written, really being able to convey a message across in the right way with the right tone and getting crisp on, um, you know, is this to inform? Is this to, uh, you know, um, set up for a discussion? Is this a debate? Whatever, what is the purpose? It's kind of going back to some of those basics, like getting really good at that because those are, are things that will, that people will look for. If you're not able to, you might have a great idea, but if you're not able to convey that, it's not gonna go anywhere, right? And so you need to really um, zone in on communication, I'd say. I agree. And if I can just add another thing about effective communication, when Tanya is mentioning this idea of empathy, I think one other aspect, if you consider yourself a US acculturated person, because we breed confidence and we, we um, bi build people up to always be the kind of first movers, to be the early ones. One thing that is about effective communication across cultures is about developing the ability to listen. If you can't listen, you won't understand what someone's trying to tell you so you can build the empathy to understand their perspective, right? So, and, and what Tanya is saying also about, uh, you know, the basics being very important written communication is also very important. And, and Tanya mentioned that, um, but I can't tell you, I think how many people lose out on opportunities because their very first pitch uh, in, in something just so simple as, as you know, a, a short email uh, is, is just, you know, even I would, I hate to say it, but our MBA students, you know, even at that level, many people just struggle with uh, basic writing uh, and communication and, and, and grammar. And so that's one, especially if this English is your, your native language, you need to really, um, it's a critical skill that it, it seems quite basic, but it's very, very important. Yeah. So along this uh, chat, and I don't know if, uh, if uh, Jay, you wanna add anything else, any hard skills that uh, you recommend that, that, that people prioritize? So we're talking about the soft skills, building empathy, building an others orientation, perceptual ability with nonverbals, uh, listening yeah. effectively, how about hard skills? Um, I guess one thing I can ask, I can add to that. Um, you know, in terms of, I guess I would just kind of a hard skill version on, on communication. Uh, although Tanya mentioned this is specifically writing in analytical, critical, persuasive writing. Um, that's, you know, I, I think absolutely invaluable. And to be, honest that is something that i see you know sometimes there's a challenge with um and and in 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 terms of when there's something happening when sometimes when people write to make a point where the information or evidence that they give in support of their conclusion there there's the, the what they present doesn't lead to the conclusion that they draw so that learning that kind of writing um and i think maybe i got it from you know that was one of the benefits of going to law school um and actually where i think it's helped you know as sachin mentioned getting a skill from one area is is bringing it over into another you know i think that's helped me <coughs> in business uh related realms uh, a lot of times i have to write proposals um i have to maybe convince certain people of a, of a, to take on a certain idea and, and you know, having that critical persuasive writing ability is, is, is absolutely invaluable. Um, obviously hard skill language, I think we've, we've covered that quite a bit, um, absolutely invaluable. Um, I don't know if you can sort a hard skill, I think it's a hard thing, but being able to, to do the miles, um, you know, being able to travel um uh around the world sometimes come home for a short period and turn around and go back again if that's if you really want to be if, you know active in international business just having the ability to, to travel um and, and dealing with the things that come with it are, is absolutely invaluable as well wonderful uh so molly has asked how should students start to job search uh, for opportunities in the international business field if they're about to graduate or recently graduated, what advice would you have on you know researching careers or career paths? Uh, any 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 guidance there? 
Molly, from, from my perspective, uh, again, the world of international business is so broad. And going back to the point that both Jay and Tanya also made about your kind of your passion or your thread, I think you have to figure out, you know, there's almost an international component to every industry and, 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 and beyond industry, as we've talked about in, in nonprofits, NGOs and government too. So I think what you really should be focused in is what do you want to do? Uh, where do you see yourself in terms of uh, your, your work? What impact do you want to have? And, and then, frankly, you know, many students have to build the credibility. Coming from a University of Wisconsin is one marker of credibility and helps you open some doors. But then beyond that, in the, in the government work or in the, the domestic business work or, or whatever, you first have to under, show that you understand the domestic context of the business or the work that you're doing. It usually takes people a year or two to become proficient in, in whatever work they are before then, uh, you know, an employer is going to extend to you the increased responsibility and ambiguity and extra expense of, of supporting you in, in that role. So I, you know, would, would turn it back to you and say, you know, what's kind of your passion and where, what industry uh, or company uh, or function do you feel really excited about? I have a student in one of my courses right now, um, you know, he, he, he didn't graduate college right away. And he's a non-traditional uh, student now on campus who, who ultimately went for community college for a few semesters. And then, uh, but now he's at uh, a, a local biotech firm and you know, started in, in, in the financial aspects of the, the firm. And now because that biotech firm is growing so quickly, um, you know, he's, he's gonna have some international treasury responsibilities. So he's had this passion for finance uh, and it didn't come to fruition right away. Uh, and he's also a, 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 an immigrant himself. And so this idea of him, you know, getting into this path of international uh, financial management has been a long path for him. Uh, but now it, it's come and he, he's followed that thread though of, of you know, being interested in finance and then you know, building the credibility. He's in the organization uh, with the path to rise, but now he needs the credibility, you know, kind of, kind of to Jay's point about coming back into doing something to go deeper. Now he feels like he needs the, the business education from our, our campus to kind of continue the, the path he's on at, at his firm. So I, I would advise you, Molly, to really think about uh, and, and w one piece of advice I have for a lot of students is I think they should, should be reading more, reading the New York Times, reading The Economist, reading the Bloomberg. Sometimes, you know, one of my classes, I ask them to, to do group projects to create their own case. And they really struggle because th they're reading everything for their business curriculum, but they're not reading enough to understand what's happening in industries and, and what, what's, what's changing in terms of uh, the, the business uh, dynamics. Uh, so I don't know if Jay or you and Tanya want anything to add to that. You want to add Tanya first and then I can. Go for it. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I, I would say second, of course, everything that uh, Sachin mentioned. Um, I want to pick up on the, you know, the, the reading and kind of try and answer one of the other questions that Aaron mentioned about how keeping up with adapting to the changing global environment. Um, and I think this is also how you can identify some of the job opportunities. Um, you know, there, there are, uh, there is an NGO, a think tank, an institution, um, some uh, for pretty much every international business issue or area that you can think of. They all have journals, they all have newsletters that you can subscribe to. So my, you know, half of my inbox probably is auto generated, you know, alerts, um, there are all the big firms now, you know, uh, the, the consulting firms, the law firms, companies, even service providers, they all have their newsletters. So kind of to a both find out about job opportunities and, and understand the business, what field, what's out there, uh, for those who are graduating, recently graduating, and also to answer Aaron questions about how to keep up with that constantly changing environment, uh, would be to kind of track those types of resources and, and do a lot of reading. I shamefully, I don't read. One thing I gave up at one point was reading for pleasure, which I don't give it up, but I, when I go to bed, I read that stuff. That's what I do. Um, and that's become my novels. That's become my nonfiction reading um, is, is a lot of those kinds of things. And um, that's how I help keep up with it. I don't know, Tanya, if you wanna add to any of that. 
Um, you know, I'll, I'll just say that the, I, I just want to really double click on this international business thing. And I think there's another question about like, is it worth pursuing? International business is, is like a plus. It's like a, you know, it's not the thing. It, there are other things with it, right? And, I, and um, it just makes it better. There's like a, it amplifies what you're working on and, it, and, and there's like a connection with it. So yes, definitely worth pursuing um, that global aspect, that more international perspective um, and, you know, learning about it, learning outside of, of your zone, that takes extra effort. It takes extra effort to understand what are the different publications out there, right? And like, how do you think of, you know, yes, New York Times, but then also think of Associated Press and economy, like other avenues of, of getting information. So you get a more full picture of things. And so um, I almost feel like you, um, it's one of those where there's so many different things that kind of fall within international business that it's hard to look at and hard to figure out. So um, I think it's it's great to think about, well, what why do you like international business, right? Like I liked, I first liked it really because I loved languages and cultures because that's what I grew up with, right? And then, I mean, then I thought, well, business, okay, what is that like, right? And so it's, it's um, digging into like, what, what do you, what are, what interests you? So if you are, you know, at night reading about something, why are you going to pick up that book instead of go to bed, right? Like at the end of a long day, you're going to read an, yet another article about the industry that you're in. Yeah, you're going to do it. Like I will read about any small business out there, right? Like I, I will do that. And I think it's, um, those are the things that you're naturally gravitated toward, gravitating toward that any of that can be international. And so it's it, um, just kind of shifting that mindset, I think, and knowing that that's really powerful to have that experience. And so looking um, at jobs, it's understanding, you know, what industries, what companies are out there, how does that, even if the first role doesn't say international or global in it, you're still at a global or international company and, and that you could move into something else. You're gonna get exposed. If you're at a global company, you are gonna get exposed to some kind of global element of it. And then you'll be like, oh, I like that. Oh, I don't like that. More exposure will get you more answers and more questions, but more answers too, um, as you go along. Thank you. Uh, there's several questions in the uh, chat about language. And I think we, all of us have, have been language learners. Uh, and uh, so, so I think people want to know, are you, has it been a barrier to, to your work, uh, the, either uh, limited language and how do you uh, maintain proficiency? Jay, someone specifically wanted to ask you how you learn Mandarin. Was it from your time there? I think you mentioned maybe you did some night classes at, um, at Berkeley. Uh, yeah, actually, it's it's interesting. I didn't study Mandarin. I didn't add that part um, until after I graduated uh, undergrad. Um, and, and so, you know, that's kind of relatively late just to start studying language, especially in this day and age. Um, but I, um, again, wherever I was, language was, I made language a part of it, Mandarin a part of it. So, um, I, right after I graduated undergrad, uh, there was an opportunity to go with one of my uh, political science professors and sort of be his research assistant in Taiwan. Um, and so while I was there helping him with research, I took a, I started, that's where I first started to take Chinese, uh, Mandarin, and I took a, a course there for six months, came back to San Francisco, I took night, night courses in Mandarin, um, I went to law school. And one of the things I did while I was in law school is actually I audited and then took, I was allowed to take uh, an undergraduate course in language. So it was, um, <laughs> and it was kind of interesting because I was in a class with, um, of uh, Chinese for native Chinese, kids from native Chinese speaking homes. Uh, th th that was not the name of the course, but it was something like that. Um, and that's just kind of where I fit. Um, but I, I did that. And then, you know, that gave me enough of a foundation. And then when I went to live in Beijing, you know, for a year, then obviously I, I kind of took off from there. And um, I have found language in my personal experience, very rarely to be a barrier, even if you have a little bit. And it's more, and this kind of goes to, a, I think, a point Tanya was making earlier, 
if, if it's not just about the purely communication, it's showing that you have a care, an interest, you're making an effort to try and understand their culture. So I would add the language and also the cultural aspect to it. But obviously, learning a little bit of the language uh, is a really e nice and clear way to do that. Great. I see we're running uh, kind of close to the, the time we had a lot today. So I think uh, there's a question that came in uh, earlier uh, in, before the, the event, uh, which would be a great way, I think, to depart on uh, some of the lessons and maybe amplify something uh, that uh, you have said already before. But what is something you know now that you wish you knew before? So I, that could be kind of uh, you know passing on the wisdom to uh, the people in the in the chat here in the on the event. That is a that's a good question. Um, I mean, there's <laughs> there's probably a lot of things uh, from my perspective. Um, I, you know, again, I, I, in my, and I'll just speak for myself. I think I wish I, I had a better appreciation, you know, for the importance, the role of, of technology. Um, and, and again, not just, not just how to use it, but how it can be used to, um, you know, especially in today's day and age, um, how to, you know, advance some of the work that you're doing like again, for for example, um, a lot of the work that I do is looking at um, analyzing business transactions to see if there are risks that the traded goods are going to go to a place that they're not, or so forth. And a lot of that historically has been done manually. It'd be someone like myself looking at documents, but now with data analytics and things like that, um, you know, you can do that to such a degree uh, that that was not possible. And, and in a way, in shape or form, I think there's, there, technology has been able to play that role probably even much earlier than I've realized. It's not like technology was just invented today. <laughs> high tech, there's always been high tech, no matter what age you live in. Um, and so just really appreciating and understanding how that technology can be leveraged in your career, I, I think was something I wish I had a much better appreciation of from earlier on, personally. Tanya, anything? Yeah, um, a student asked me this last week and I said I should have paid attention in my stats class a little bit more. You wouldn't think being in HR that you would you would do that. And I'm pretty analytical, um, but uh, we've, we've been doing a lot of, um, um, anyways, uh, I, I wish I paid attention in my stats class a bit more. Um, and I think there is some truth to this around you know, sometimes you're in school and you're like, you, you have a test, you get through it, but there, uh, there are things that you need, <laughs> you do need them. And I know that sounds silly, but you, you do. So pay attention to those things because they will come up later. Um, and I think those are important to, to think about. Yeah. Great. Well, uh, thank you, uh, Tanya and Jay, uh, for spending the time with us. Uh, thank you to Carmen for all the background work in making this a seamless event for everybody. Thank you to the IR, IRIS NRC for sponsoring today's event. Uh, also to the Wisconsin School of Business, the Center for South Asia and the International Studies major for also being co-sponsors. Hope everyone has a great evening. Again, there will be a post-event uh, post email with a copy of the recording should you want to uh, review it then. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. everybody.